Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here with Grittiest Take. I'm Andrew Santangelo, and of course, I'm here with Joe Borg today. How you doing, Joe? Uh, doing good. Doing good. We'll post uh, the NHL draft, so now everybody has a little bit of a break. Uh, teams are doing the uh, rookie camp, so you have that to pay attention to. But uh, there's a good break uh, way, and then all the actual guys that are going to make the team next year will be reporting in about a month or so, depending when some of them with the Flyers especially like to show up early. So it'll be interesting to see who the early guys like the Bryce Harper's of the Flyers because the Flyers tend to have those guys too. It's always good to see the early birds because that means they care the most, you know. <clears throat> That's true. And, and speaking of those early birds and, and players, I mean, obviously we have a, a draft to, to recap, a, a trade to recap, and then – What's going to happen possibly this off season? We get a new coach already this off season, so a lot to dive into, of course. So let's start with some of these players. Uh, like you said, Joe, the, the draft happened this past week, so that's where we're going to dive into. The Flyers ended up with the trade. They ended up going with uh, six picks in this draft, and then of course the trade. So we'll just start with the first rounder, uh, Joe. Why don't you fill fill us in here with uh, what happened? Uh, on the draft night with the fifth overall pick in, in Cutter. Yeah, well, I think the Flyers pretty much went with what was expected. If you looked at a lot of the projections, I even saw somebody tweet it after. Uh, I can't remember what hockey analyst it was, but it was like, wow, the Flyers actually went with what was expected for once. Because most things had been pegged with picking Cutter Gauthier, which usually the Flyers, when anybody has a peg for doing anything, they tend to do the exact opposite of what the thing has them pegged for doing. So it definitely seems like they came in. A lot of people, even Jim Jackson, when I know Steele and I talked to him, said they were going for size. Well, this draft, except for um, our seventh round uh, pick, Alexis Gendron, is all size. And he's a seventh round pick, so we'll see what comes with him in time. But you have otherwise you have all size in this draft and it seems like the the big thing too is unlike a guy like Arizona got Connor Geeky who they traded up for who I think is a solid player but's not the best skater all the guys that the Flyers got with size are good skaters so they didn't just prioritize like they did sometimes in the past with the Connor Boonemans of the world guys that I liked that were good box shouters with size or a guy that I like that I'm surprised we didn't at least keep around on a qualifying and Matthew Strome, who's not a great skater, but is good at boxing guys out. They now focused on size with speed, excuse me, which is the new era of the league, as you kind of see around the league, especially with the avalanche. Look at the avalanche and look at guys that are 6'2", 6'3", that fly. That's pretty much what, what other than the conference of the world and other guys they have mixed in, who they kind of build that squad around. So I think Cal McCarr is a huge defenseman that flies. So it seems like teams and the Flyers definitely seem to replicate that. Once you see a team win one way, you try to replicate that. Teams try to get more hard nosed after the Blues won again and then realize that's not really the new age style. So then teams started adjusting to how Tampa was able to play. And now I think teams are going to do like a hybrid between how Tampa plays because that's very effective, obviously, compared to how Colorado plays because both of those teams seem to be the two most effective in the league currently, so you're probably going to see teams, that's kind of how things work, emulate them, and it seems like the Flyers in the draft have worked pretty hard at doing so, and I think Gauthier is going to work out well because he's a very good scorer, and the Flyers' primary need is scoring. Whether he averages 30 assists or 50 assists in a season, I could care less if he averages 30, about 28 to 30 goals. Like, that's my biggest priority with him, if he becomes a very good goal scorer, that's the main thing the Flyers need, and he seemed like he was one of the better scorers in the draft, and that's a main asset that obviously I don't think will help us this year with that. He's going to go to Boston, but yep. next season he seems like he's going to be ready after one year from his own accord, so I'll take his word for it until proven otherwise, so he might be able to help as soon as next year. You know, absolutely. I think there's a lot to, to get behind this pick. I think it was great that we actually kept it. I know there's a lot of rumors going into the draft, whether we try to trade trade it away and get extra assets there or what was going to happen. So I, mean, I think it was important to get that pick, especially with where this team has been at the last few years, especially this last season. I don't know. He, he kind of reminds me he, he has the potential to be very good. I mean, as long as I think he can open up the scoring as well, and we'll see how you play out the rest of free agency between this year and next year on who he's going to be able to play with. That's what's kind of hard to kind of grade the fit a little bit is just because 
you don't know what's going to be here in, in the next few years. That's so. the thing. Yeah. It's hard to grade when you don't know who people – because a thing that was interesting, too, and I think you're going to find this interesting because when he said it, I found it very interesting. Jason Martinez, who's obviously very renowned in the hockey community, said to me he thinks of everything in pairs, whether it's forwards or defense, and he still thinks of it in pairs. So, like, if Frost is still on the team, Frost and Tippett is kind of the duo because they both were in juniors together, and then if Cates is on the wing or Lindblom, that's the extra person. So, and I kind of found that interesting where, because that kind of makes sense, because even if you go back to Pittsburgh when they had uh, Connor Sheary, his best years were in Pittsburgh because he was with Crosby or Malkin. So that was kind of the pair, whether he was with Crosby or Malkin. So uh, I think it's kind of about finding that pair. So I think if Cooch can stay healthy, uh, depending if Gauthier plays center or wing, obviously having two big guys that Gauthier is probably even a better skater than Cooch. That could work because Cooch is a great playmaker with Gauthier being a scorer, but that would also then depend on whether they want to use him as center or when. Because if they want to use him as center, then he's definitely going to be your second-line center because he's not going to overtake Sean Couturier. So that's all going to depend. If you want him in the top three, he's going to have to play wing. If you want him in the top six, then he can play center. So that's going to be something they have to process where it seems like they want him to play center so I think their bet is he's going to be their second line center, and he can be a pretty damn good one if he becomes a good scoring second line center with that size. So I'm all for trying him at center because I think by default he's going to be a very good winger at least. So it's like if it doesn't work great, then we still have a good scoring winger. So I like the pick. I think it was a safe pick, and sometimes it's good to pick somebody that makes perfect sense for you and not overthink it. I think Juracek would have also been a solid pick. And I would have been fine with either because we need a goal scorer or we need a very good righty defenseman. So the fact that we got the goal scorer, uh, I'm cool with that. So I, I I definitely would give that pick like an A for sure because it's kind of what I had expected going into the draft. I know some people got all butthurt because Shane Wright went one before us. You can't control that. So it, it is what it is. I think they did a pretty good job. No, I agree with you. I, I think they did the safe pick. That's what matters is not Sometimes you need that. You can't overthink it, especially when you're that high and desperate enough to need that pick. So moving on to the Flyers' second pick of the draft here. Uh, ended up being in the third round, 69th overall. They go with Devin Kaplan. Uh, and, I mean, he's an 18-year-old coming off a uh, season. Uh, his junior, junior team, the under-18 junior team. So uh, another... An interesting pick here as well. I think they kind of took a, a stretch pick, hoping for the best here. It wasn't as much of a an easy home run pick as, as it was in the first round. But I mean, what do you what do you think about this pick overall? I I like it because I like how the Flyers. A lot of other teams, the Flyers started doing it. Obviously, last year even because Tippett connects with Frost, they kind of use connectivity of a roster where people have had past interactions with each other and that's how your locker room chemistry is already good at the early onset well Kaplan and Gauthier came up with each other in the U.S. development team so I think he's a pretty good second round pick if they both develop I don't know if they're both good if Kaplan is going to be a top nine or a top six but they might both play together at some point at least on their way up they have the familiarity with each other and even if, say, Kaplan isn't necessarily a prototypical top six, Chris Kunis wasn't your prototypical top six. Either was Connor Sheary. There's other guys throughout the history of the NHL that play great with certain people, and that's why they get put in the top six. He has speed to go along with his size, so it's kind of like it's kind of like you picked a lesser polished righty version of Gauthier, so to speak. Like, Gauthier is the guy that looks like he's going to be a stud and be good right next season. Kaplan's the right-handed shot that looks like he might take a few years, but um, going to BU is a very good program that is probably going to mentor him along. That I think he's a very safe second-round pick that is probably at least going to become an NHL, or it's just is he going to become maybe what a second-round pick should be as an NHL, or is he just going to become that very good fourth-liner? That's what we have to see over time, but it seems like the way he plays the game and the way he looked with the U.S. juniors because the Flyers draft was kind of easy for me to recap because they picked a bunch of American guys that I know who they are. Uh, so that worked out. Uh, but Kaplan seems like uh, he's a guy that if you give him time, don't rush it. He'll be good. And I think the Flyers now with Danny B, 
are going to have a mentality of giving everybody a different work structure and not kind of trying to fudge people like the Phillies used to do into kind of one structure that doesn't work for everybody. So I think that's going to be kind of more helped by having Breer along going forward like he did with the main Mariners in the ECHL. So I feel like he's a good pick. I would give that like a B because obviously, like you said, there's questions to what his ceiling can be, but it seems like he could be a steal in terms of being at least a career NHL or, and if you get that with the 69th pick, that's not bad. So. You know, absolutely. Well, that would I, be I, don't know. I, meant, I meant a floor. That would be a floor. And then your ceiling would probably be a top six. So like, that's not bad with the second round thing. I said that back with, yeah, they said I was reading. They said he was a uh, th- third line center on his, the junior league team. Obviously, um, very excuse me. It was a very a talented roster. So obviously, not exactly. much to take away from there. Uh, playing on on a very good roster there. So we'll we'll see how it goes um, in in terms of that. But no, I think again, especially in the third round there. You mentioned it earlier on the show, needing that the right side there. That's what Kaplan brings here going on. To uh to the to the Flyers here. Now moving on to, to the Flyers next pick here. Flyers third pick of the draft, 133rd overall pick. And this was um this was another pick. He, we, uh, the pick is Alex Bump, left wing uh player here for the Flyers. And basically another skill forward. Uh he Flyers obviously attacking uh highly on the offense here with the draft here in the first couple picks. Went with the, the ability of trading for a defender early on, which we'll get in here into a little bit after we do the recap. But a left wing guy here in Alex Bump. Joe, what are your thoughts on him? And, and does it continue to be a good draft so far for the Flyers? Yeah, well, he's a guy that's obviously the rawest. He came out, he played a few games in the USHL, played the most in a high school league, which he dominated. Uh, but uh, he's a guy that's definitely going to take the most time. But he was projected by some in the third. So to be able to get a guy that was projected by some in the third and the fifth, yeah, I think you got to give your team props for being able to keep on the scouting board and find somebody uh, like him. And the Flyers also lately, like with the Elliott Desnoyers of the world, the Zade Wisdoms of the world, have picked in those fourth and fifth rounds really well. So it seems like Brett Flair kind of has sometimes even a better judging on the middle of the draft at times than even the beginning. Well, this draft, I think he knocked it all, but it seems like he really is good at the middle. This guy was supposed to be picked earlier. Why he fell, maybe we'll find out in time, or maybe it was just this draft. I think it was more just how this draft played out a lot different than people expected. And a lot of guys fell that were third-round guys supposed to be second. Bump was just one of those culprits of the beast. And the Flyers are kind of able to get their hands on him, but I think he's more of a four- or five-year project, but that's fine because he's a fifth-round pick. And then Kaplan, I would say, is a three-year project. And then I would say Gauthier could be up by next year. So, and then also, he, you could see, because of when the college season ends, depending what his team does, like we have with other players, like, of course, Cates this past year and Ronnie Adder, you could see him play some the end of this year if they decide not to give him time with the Phantoms. So you don't use that call-up and you just have him come straight from college so it doesn't use one of your call-ups. So I could also see that being the case if he dominates, but... That would be if they don't think he needs any AHL time, I would think, unless if they just do what they did with Brink and just say, screw it, let's just let him roll. But that would depend where the team is in terms of standings, probably. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, again, and then for me, once you get down to these later half of the draft, it's tough to kind of grade just because you don't know, like give a, a letter grade on the pick because you don't know how it's going to be. Like you said, some of these guys – are projected to go forward, but sometimes, you know, with the, how the draft is, if it's a stack class, if it's just a weird, the way it's shaping out to be, you get guys that fall, and, and this could be a big, big pick for the Flyers here, depending if that's the case. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a, I think I would give it a, somewhere in the B category, just because of his project, like experts that have been doing this for years, had him projected in the third, and he fell to the fifth, so just from that reasoning, and the fact from everything I've, read in the <clears throat> film I've been able to see on him since we drafted him. He looks like a pretty solid talent, just a very role talent. That's why I would say he's at the five-year benchmark to be ready for the NHL. But other guys have impressed and come up sooner than that, so we'll have to see what happens over time. Okay. Now, moving on to the next pick, the Flyers' fourth pick of the draft, 165th overall. 
Uh, their only defenseman picked picked in this draft uh, was Hunter McDonald, and he's a big, big defender here, 6'4", 205 pounds. So Flyers going for a little, like you mentioned, they wanted size, and that's what they get here, uh, a big guy, big defender. Won't provide much on the offense, but it's supposed to be able to uh, help man the fort down there on the defensive end. How, how much do you like this pick? If he can develop his hockey sense in the way of, He's not. It's not like he's bad at judging plays. It's just he's bad at not taking penalties. So if he can get more disciplined, I guess is a better way to put it. He probably could be a good third line defender that can block out the net front and do the things you would want your third pairing, just stand up defenseman that can just pound guys at the blue line and keep guys out of the net front to just be that steady Eddie, like say two point five to three point three million dollar AAV defenseman that just gets it done each year for you. But that's a if because of the fact of you can't have 183 penalty minutes and expect to be that effective. Like the fact that now in the USHL, yeah, because it's the USHL and you're 6'4", 205, not many other people are 6'4", 205 and decently quick. So, yeah, you're, you're going to get away with it and still put up good numbers like you did around the penalty minutes. But in the AHL and NHL is your progressing you're not putting up good numbers if you're in the penalty box most of the time so you have to discipline your game but the fine pools of his game are encouraging but again it's like a when you pick a guy 165th overall if you're saying anything about the fact that his fine tools are encouraging that's a good sign so I think that's the way that's kind of the way I would put it like if he doesn't pan out, it doesn't matter. He was the 165th overall pick. If he does, fantastic. That's a bonus. So, like, all the rest of these three picks after this, that's kind of the way I look at that. Because the Flyers have picked good in the later rounds, but the later rounds are really throwing it at a dartboard and hoping it sticks. So, they at that point, you if you hit on any of these three, and McDonald, Solku, who we'll get to, and the small kid, Gendron, you're golden because you hit on one of the three. And then if you hit on most of the guys above, even if it's just Kaplan and um, Gauthier, you're golden too. So I think this is a good draft all in all. It's just going to be interesting to see if he can refine his game and not be wild. He kind of reminds you of Zach Ronaldo of defenseman. So you have to tone it down a little bit. No, absolutely. Uh, and I think that that kind of goes to the next pick as well in, in Solku is you drafted another big guy this time the le- another left winger he's 6'3 185 pounds to 200 I've seen a couple different reports on that so thought that was interesting but another another tall aggressive player here coming on the wing I, I his shot is his best part is, is what I what I found out when I was reading up on him and watching things but it sounds like he struggles skating wise so that's his biggest question mark on how he's gonna be able to do that skating and controlling the puck but if he's able to give you a good offensive spot there and a nice shot, it could go a long way if he's able to get get scoring. Like you said, these are the picks you want a chance, and that's what the, seems like the Flyers did here with the 197th pick of the draft in Solku. It was a nice chance pick with a big player. Yeah, I mean, he kind of reminds you of, like, a better scoring version of, like, a Matthew – Strom type guy that started developing this year, but the Flyers still let him go. So I uh, wish him all the best, unless we sign him as a, or as an unrestricted now. But Soku reminds you of a guy that actually can be a scorer with that. Because if you have that shot, Strom was always more of an ins and outs player that he developed into. Soku is a guy that looks like he's a late round scorer. Now, is that going to be a guy that develops into an NHL level mid 20 scorer, or a guy that's just a good teeners to 20 goal scorer? Either way, if you get that in the seventh round I think would be the 197th pick uh so like you're you're in a very good spot at that point he kind of reminds me more so the way that they say he has a great shot good scoring ability has to kind of learn how to master the size of his body he kind of honestly reminds you of a late round version of Connor Geeky like Connor Geeky's the freakish talent that fits into that player category that that's why he's a first round talent because with Geeky it's basically if he can get the skating down he's a stud where with Solko it's more if he can get the skating down he's probably a good third line but even then if you picked a guy in the seventh round 
that if he can get the skating down more, that scores 15 to 20 goals in the season, that becomes a good third line, or I'm not going to play him. So I think they stuck with the theme. What I really like about it is he's a finish forward. Those guys tend to have, like we've seen some of the other forward guys you picked up later around, kind of develop quickly because those guys tend to have the fundamentals down. Like they get it ingrained to them like it's a freaking army boot camp at a young age. So I think going with a foreign guy, the first guy later rounds makes sense. And maybe you can ha- have him develop into a teener <clears throat> bottom six goal scorer because if he learns how to use his body, he could also be a fourth line teener goal scorer too. That can do a little bit more for you and uh, box guys out. So it all depends how he learns how to use his size over time. But playing in the Swedish league is definitely going to help you learn how to do that. So. Well, no, absolutely. And going on to the final pick for the Flyers, 220th overall, the sixth pick for the Flyers on the day. They're short, the, the smallest guy they actually got was Alexis, uh, was it, is it Gendron? Gendron, I think Gendron. is how you pronounce it. Yeah, so, yeah. He, he's, he comes in at 5'9", 175 pounds. And again, he's, he's the only player actually that the Flyers drafted that wasn't at least six feet tall. So I went away from the, the, the height there. They obviously had plenty throughout that draft. But another highly skilled forward. He's going to uh, compete for – or not, he's going to be – he plays one of the wing spots. We'll see what he does. He probably skates pretty well um, for his size. But we'll see what what all the whole tools he's able to bring here into the team. Yeah. From all the stuff I've been able to gather on him, his biggest issue, it seems, is confidence from what a lot of people have written about him, whether it's on EP or on uh, Broadstreet or on different stuff that Nitty Gritty's written about him. Uh, it seems to be if he uses his shot more with his speed, he might be able to be effective, kind of like how uh, Connor Garland, I believe, was also a late-round pick. I think he was a seventh-round pick. They uh, didn't have the best season last year the former Yoke, but is still a good player in my eyes. Uh, if you can kind of get that snarl to just be confident, not necessarily you're not going to be hitting people around the ice at 5'9", but the snarl to just be really confident in what your best asset is, he might be able to be one of those guys that breaks it because if you're able to just use your speed and utilize your shot like kind of Danny B did, and you're also in an organization that has Danny B to teach you how to do that too, so that helps. Uh, I think that can be helpful. And also the Flyers have a couple guys like the Sami Tumalas, who's going to be playing overseas this year. They confirm that. And I think that's good for him to have a full year overseas. He's on the small end. Atkins is still on the small end. If you keep connect me, he's still, so they have a couple guys that still fit into that category. They just want to mix in size around them because we hadn't had enough good, quick skating size guys around those small R guys. So I think this is a guy that still has guys to learn from in the organization. So it's not like he's going to be lost in the shuffle of all these massive guys that nobody's going to be able to mentor him. So I, I think this is a pick that's also just kind of a shot in the dark too, because it's the pick we got from the D'Angelo trade. So this one's kind of basically, well, he seems like he could be a good, maybe the next uh, Connor Garland. Let's just take a shot at him. And then whatever happens, happens basically at that point. I think that's more kind of the way they looked at that play. You know, I hear you. Uh, and again, it's it's tough to, to know what these late players are going to do. But overall, I don't know where you stand. It's getting overall grade. I'm going to give – I give the Flyers A-. I, I thought they did very well on the, the front end. And then you can take a couple chance guys. I like the size they're trying to go with. Flyers have always been a little bit undersized these last few years. So I like the chances there, hoping for some of them to grow. But I'm going to go A- minus overall in the draft before we even get to, to the trade. I'm just going strictly yeah. picks. Yeah, I would say based off of the picks, yeah, it's an A- minus because you didn't have the uh, – other than Gauthier, after that, you didn't have – the assets to necessarily get the A plus or A grade, but I think being able to negotiate mixed with Kaplan, they both have familiarities. I think you got two good guys there. Getting a guy that was third round projected in the fifth really helps. And then McDonald was basically just get disciplined, and you might have a solid guy there. And then between Solku and Gendron, if any of them between Solku, Gendron, and McDonald pan out, you have a great draft compared to a very good draft. So I think, yeah, an A minus is a very accurate way to put it. Well, sounds good. Now, moving on here to probably the biggest controversy uh, for the Flyers here in the last few days, and that's trading for defenseman Tony D'Angelo from the 
from the Carolina Hurricanes, which it, well, I'll let you dive in. This is where I'm, I'm most interested to get your take here, too. But the Flyers trade for him as they send three picks to the Hurricanes, the 2024 second-round pick, a 2023 third-rounder, and a 2022 fourth-round pick, uh, obviously, which was this past draft, and a 2022 seventh-round pick. All, well, the Flyers got the 2022 seventh-round pick, which we are already uh, talked about. But a lot of controversy here. Not much so for his talent on the ice, but stuff that has, has hurt his NHL career off the ice via teammates, social media, etc. I mean, based off what I've been seeing on social media, Flyers fans seem pretty split about it on, on Twitter just from, again, the Bye. stuff that's happened. But I, I don't know. Obviously, we don't, we don't talk about the whole fan base. We only count for our own opinion. So... I guess first off, what are your thoughts on the trade? Uh, what are your thoughts on the trade, and how much do you take into account that off the ice stuff? I take it into account a lot. I mean, the one guy I know I got into a back and forth with one of our usually a nice guy, one of the good activists of Philadelphia, was basically saying because I disagree with his opinion, I was automatically racist. But that's a different story for a different time. Um, that's kind of how people have perceived this. That's why it's so divided. Like some people, if you disagree with their take on Tony D'Angelo, you're automatically racist. So like, it's a weird thing the, with the, because the Flyers got a defenseman that if you look at the hockey side of it, that fits a lot of things that people have been asking for in the checkbox of he's not the best defensively. No, everybody knows that about Tony D'Angelo, but he's a guy that fits the offensive defenseman that can get you about a points per game, a point seven five points per game uh, in a season and be a very good power play quarterback, very good offensive defenseman. And that's kind of what Flyers fans have been asking for a while. The problem is they got that in the realm of Tony D'Angelo, who has had problems in the past. So I think the other thing is Philly, and this is what I love about Philly, has a lot of different diversity. It's a pretty woke city. So I think that plays into it a lot, too. And it's going to be interesting to see if he can, over time, earn the rest of the trust of the rest of the city. Because I think, like you said, it is kind of split. Uh, Where some people are like, well, he deserves, like, it seemed like, from everything you read. And this is kind of the side, now, to get to where I kind of stand. It seems like, from everything you read, because I hated him. Like, I think I said this on the phone to you before coming into last year. I even tried to give him a chance. He had a podcast a while ago. I tried to listen to that, and he still kind of came off as a prick. But then he went to stepped away from the game a bit. Chris Terrian said he did very good coaching um, when he was coaching kids and stuff. And then he stepped back in with Carolina with Rob Rindemore, who's one of the best coaches in the game, and seemed to really get his act together there. And we know Torch ain't going to put up with shit either. So... It seems like he's in the right position if he is finally maturing to continue maturing. And the last thing I would say on that is if you watch that interview with his dad, you can tell why he has the wrong worldviews. That's all I have to say about that. His dad definitely did not teach him well. So I think when you put all of that into it, it seems like now he's finally realizing who he actually is and separating from the what kind of his family made him to be uh that's um the uh big thing for me that i think is going to help him going forward but it's going to be a big if because philly does give you a lot more opportunities to get in trouble than Carolina. so we do have to see over time too because let's be honest where it's not like in carolina there's a lot of stuff compared to philadelphia or new york to get in trouble in, in like the other destinations he was in. So that's the only worry I would have. He's in a city that's a city, a nightlife city compared to where he was at when he was more responsible last year. So that's the only worry I would have because you would have more opportunities to basically get drunk and get in trouble, just to put it bluntly. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, so like that, that's why uh, it'll, it will be interesting to see, but player wise, I like, the fit for we need a quarterback of the offense. We need a guy that can move the puck up and be the type of player he is. 
And I also don't agree with the people that are saying you paid a $5 million for a third pairing defenseman. If you look at Tony D'Angelo's minutes per his career, he usually averages out as about at least the minutes of a second pair defenseman. So most, a lot of second pair defensemen nowadays get paid at least high fours or into the five million. So I don't really think it was out of the market to pay him five million per year. Uh, now, could you have maybe got him for four or something? Maybe, but the, it's one million. Like I'm not tripping over that. I think that was okay in the market share. It's just he comes with the baggage. But I think people deserve extra chances. Like, if they seem like they're trying, if you seem like you're not trying and you don't care about your personality, then you don't deserve an extra chance because you just seem like you don't care. But when it seems like you actually are making an attempt, and it seems like from all the stuff from Carolina, he became a model guy there. And the guy he had an incident with in juniors, him and uh, D'Angelo are still friends, so they got over. I don't know about he and Keandre Miller if they ever got over that, but it seems like people kind of understand him in the end. He just comes off sometimes because of the way he was raised as a unbeknownst prick, basically, uh, where then once he gets set straight, he's like, oh, wow, I was really a prick. So like, if, <laughs> the fact that he can realize that is a big battle in the first place. So I, I think that's what's going to continue to help him realizing that he was kind of very off base as a younger athlete, and now he's trying to fix that. So if he can continue to be on that road plus produce like he did last year, I don't think they're going to have any problems. Yeah, no, I think you raised a, a lot of good points there. I think it's obviously everyone has their own opinion on this, and it, it's going to be a tough to, to find, find a standpoint, but – at this point, I mean, he's going to be out there, obviously. And if you're going strictly hockey, he fills a lot of different spots that th- this team needed, especially a guy that can have a little offensive spot on defense and gives you some of that need there uh, for that end. So, I mean, overall, from a hockey standpoint, I think it was a, a solid trade for the Flyers. Obviously, you give up a lot and a handful of picks there. But in the end, if, if this works out, I think it, it could go a long way for, for the Flyers here and, and show a lot of success. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a trade that is either, I mean, it's kind of like a trade that literally is the microcosm theme of this season. It's either sink or swim, baby. <laughs> like, yeah. like that's what this, that's what and, this trade also is. Like, hey, it's and, either this is going to really work or it's going to be the biggest cluster mess that you're going to watch before you're <laughs> Yeah. We talked about it a little bit last year, last night before when, when we we're kind of just going over things. And I, I think this is, um, similar to last year in a way is you kind of put all your uh, eggs into one basket hoping for the best not necessarily the same style I'm just saying like they did okay we're going to go all in here and if it works it's going to be really successful if it doesn't it's not going to be successful and obviously it came back to bite us and we'll, we'll see what happens this upcoming season on how this one does as well but if you unless you have anything else on the draft here we can we can dive into some of the offseason plans yeah, we can go into um, that now. Yeah, there's a couple things that I definitely have on that. Yeah, so before the show, and, and as you mentioned here in our intro, we were talking about a lot of different things that could happen to the Flyers this offseason. You don't have much wiggle room with the cap. You have some. You could throw, like we just talked about, you could put all, all the money towards one player uh, in terms of a superstar that you want to try to go get but limit where you're going to spend elsewhere, or you can kind of spread out the wealth there and, and bring in a handful of of top guys me personally i I think you kind of got to pick and choose i I think at this point you need you need a name in the city to to rally behind to really get uh tickets or people to show back up in in terms of that i think you kind of lack that last year after you you traded Giroux. it's going to be which player i get you have some young guys and travis connectney and every and you have travis connectney obviously and other guys and company that that will but they're not that big of names in terms of NHL, like NHL top names to bring in seats like Giroux was here. So to me, it might be worth that because you have some young talent here still. I mean, I know it didn't pan out last year, but you still have guys to pair with some of them. So I am want to be against going out and bringing in a, a highly talented superstar. I don't know about you. 
if you can find a way to like right now, I would be against it because it would just screw you for the future if you don't. The again, I feel like the Flyers are getting better at developing talent, but until I fully see that effect, I don't want to screw our cap for the future and have to fully rely on it. Uh, so I feel like right now I'm more just by the way. Fletcher himself put us in this cap position, so there's nobody else to blame but himself. They're probably better patching things to put together a good lineup. Like, for example, there's a lot of good guys. Like, I feel like their best bet might be there's a lot of good guys, like the other two Stroms, for example, that didn't get qualified. But, well, I think Ryan was already a UFA. But Dylan Strom didn't get qualified by Chicago. So you have guys, a, a lot of players... Sonny Milano also didn't get qualified by Anaheim for some reason. So you have a lot of, like, 24-year-olds, 25-year-olds that are still growing. Some that really had good seasons last year, and it's weird they didn't get qualified, like Sonny Milano. But if you play with that market, sometimes you get a lot of bang for your buck. And I feel like the Flyers' best bet for next year is to try to go with bang for your buck and then utilize the money you're going to have saved. Because if you look at their cap, JVR falls off. So you're then going to have more money in next offseason. I feel like next offseason is this offseason, unfortunately, for a Flyers fan. It's like, uh, that is more you're going to have room to play with the bigger free agents, where this one is you have a lot of really good bargain free agents, too. I think you should utilize that, basically. Max Domi even falls into a category of another bargain free agent that Flyers fans have wanted for years. So... I think there are certain guys that could fit into the category of a very good bargain, affordable two-year contract guys that might play better. Dominic Kubalik also didn't get qualified. He's a goal scorer. He just had a struggling season last year. But if you can get him back to 20, 25 goals and you have a pretty good uh, third-line goal scorer there and you don't have to worry about the draft picks because he wasn't qualified. So I think as much as I want Johnny Gaudreau, like, I'm with you on that. I want him. It's just I don't see it as a possibility with the way the Flyers' cap structure is. Especially, like I said, I'm fine with the contract of Tony D'Angelo, but you did give him $5 million. So you really have to now get rid of JVR, even if that means maybe getting rid of Konechny to get rid of JVR, whatever it takes if you want to get Johnny Gaudreau. Like, you're going to have to do, be willing to do that. And it seems like from... What you read, the Flyers aren't willing to give up the extra with JVR to get rid of them, and I'm assuming usually that extra probably is Travis Konechny. That would just be my guess, because he's a very solid asset that if you can get him back to a more of a shooting mentality, then he's a great asset. So I think he, I would assume he's the guy that's usually picked up by teams when they want to try to get JVR. They're like, well, if you give us TK, then sure. But the thing is, at the same time, if you're getting Goudreau, they should do that trade. But if you're, you have to know that you're basically have a, like you've been talking to his agent, you're going to have the numbers work out basically after you get that money off of your cap. You can't just trade Konechny and Van Riemsdyk and then start talking to Johnny Goudreau. So like the, the Flyers would have to play that, like how things always work behind the scenes. But if you can play it like that, then I'm fine with getting Johnny Goudreau. I just from, Seeing things, I'm very skeptical if they're going to be able to get rid of JVR, and I feel like they're just going to have to have him at this point, which means next year is kind of the big money offseason, and this year is more the let's utilize the uh, good bargain guys, like even that Antetisio, uh kid who was with the um, Kings, uh, or Miles Wood, who if he can stay healthy, you could probably trade the Devils a fifth-round pick or something for him, or maybe a fourth to get a solid one of the fastest skaters in the league. His only question is health. And if I'm giving up a fourth or fifth, I don't like if he only plays 30 games, it doesn't work out. Well, that sucks. But like, it's not that big of a deal. So there's like a lot of guys that I think can really be the good bargains, just like Frank Petrano's of the world basically became good bargains for the Rangers last year, who I think also is a free agent, actually. So like there's all those different types of guys that that's how I would play just because I think it makes more sense business wise. But fan wise, I'm definitely with you on the whole Johnny Goudreau thing, it's just seeing it from the side of not screwing us for the future, I feel like it makes more sense to play with the affordability market that has a lot of, probably the best pool of players in a while, honestly, in that B-, minus, C+, plus, and B tier. I think you have some of the better players in a while, honestly, in that tier that have a chance, like Dylan Strome, for example, to have his career year with you, maybe, because he's only 25. 
So, like, I think if you play with that, it gives you more flexibility for next year. Because I feel like the guy that honestly would have fit better for the Flyers is the guy that went back to Nashville just because Johnny Goudreau's amazing. It would be a hometown return. But for Tortorella's system, Forsberg would have worked better because Philippe Forsberg is one of the better two-way wingers. Johnny Goudreau just got good at defense under Daryl Sutter last year. So you have to see how that continues to progress. Now, again, if you put up 85 or more points, it don't really freaking matter. But at the same time, I think the degree of the player style would have worked better for Forsberg. So it's going to be interesting to see, especially because you brought in a more A offensive defenseman to a B minus defensive defenseman in Tony D. I don't know if you're going to try to add a forward that's more offense and not as much defense either compared to adding some guys that kind of fit into both realms with Tortorella. So that's the other side that would be uh, interesting for me to see. As well, there's also an interesting player, though, that plays all three positions. I wouldn't be shocked because he's going to fall under Goudreau. He's still going to be. He wanted, I think, like $5 million per year, if I remember correctly. He wants to take the Zach Hyman contract. The guy that was with the Rangers, Andrew Kopp. I saw some things about the Flyers maybe being interested in him, and he would get paid pretty much. So he would just give two guys. He would probably get a longer contract than D'Angelo. But you would give two guys a $5 million AAV. I could see the Flyers more so doing that than dishing out like 10, 11 to Johnny and then 5 to Tony D. Because even if you do two $5 million, when JVR falls off, that still gives you more flexibility for next year. Plus, it would still let you maybe pick up one of a Dylan Strom or if you uh, pick up like a Chance guy and a Jask and a Tierney, definitely those guys because they're cheaper. Uh, so you'd be able to get somebody like that that fits into that category. And if the Devils are actually looking to trade Pavel Zaka, they're another team that you could probably trade a middle-round pick at this point because of his health. Uh, and not really necessarily his health, but their question marks with him, I guess, is a better way to put it with him. And be able to get him for like a third or a fourth. So there's a lot of different guys that are RFAs, too, that I think will probably be on different teams next year via getting the rights traded. So. I think there's a lot of room to play around there, but I see an Andrew Kopp being more in the realm of possibility of like a B-plus free agent rather than the A-plus. Well, well, you honestly stole my my uh, stole, stole thunder on the next question there. I was going to ask you a couple guys to name, but obviously you did a great job there figuring out some tell, – tell, informing us on some other guys that possibly might be good to trade for or, or possibly sign. So I guess – my question to you, you mentioned a two, three-year deal-ish. Would you rather than, like, a full-on veteran, like a, a 35-year-old who's probably got about two years left on him, or would you rather <laughs> hope that, like, a, a thirty-one, a 30 to 31 year old's hoping to just get a two-year deal? It's like, what what kind – are you like, – so when you, when you mentioned kind of – So, when you ask there, me if I want Evgeny Morka. Yeah, yeah, you can throw him out back. But <laughs> something tells me he'll probably be on a little bit of the pricier side, right? Uh, yeah, I would think I would think Malkin's at least going to stay around. Is not he might drop from nine five to like eight, but like for thirty five year old that plays forty five games, hopefully more. I don't know if you want to pay that eight million dollars, even though he's going to produce forty five points in forty five games. Just still, you have to hope he's then healthy in the postseason. So, yeah, so maybe I'm talking more like like a, a David Perron, thirty four year old, made four million last year with St Louis. Uh, like, is he an option there, or are you talking more like, I don't know, say... Well, he uh, could be an option, I think, if he... I, I feel like he's going to go back to St. Louis just because of... It seems like a great fit just for him to stay, but if he doesn't stay, I think he could be an option. I think mm-hmm. Ryan Strom could be a realistic option because he play, he's flexible. Ryan Strom's also the more... Like, he's already developed. I could also see them going for both because Dylan's more of a center and Ryan's more of a... I mean, he plays center at wing, but he's more of the flexible guy. I think uh, Dylan, you can put at wing with our team, but with the Blackhawks, you profile better at center. With our team, you have other big guys that we now drafted, and you have guys like Katori coming back. Like, he could fit well on a wing, maybe with Coots. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if they go. Like, I wouldn't be opposed to getting both of those guys just because their family is really good fundamentally, and they are late bloomers. Ryan 
bloomed at 25. Dylan's now at 25, really did well once the interim head coach came in last year in Chicago. So he's coming off of really feeling good about himself to round out a season two, entering his prime age, and didn't get qualified for whatever reason. So that's a different story for a different time. Um, so I would say if you can get him for three something, and Ryan's probably more like five, seven to six, eight, maybe even seven mil. You're kind of doing what the Phillies did with Schwarber and Castellanos and putting two guys into what one person paid for one guy, so to speak. And I feel like the Flyers might be better off trying to do trade or not trade, trying to do acquisitions like that. And even if you got Dylan Strome and he took a one year deal to try to prove himself for like two million that would then open up to you maybe being able to get give, get cop for $5 million, and then even go to Ryan's from and say, if you come in for six, look at the guys we just brought in. This team's really starting to fall into place with you here, who's really a good two-way player. You're just going to help us even further. And then guys sometimes in that setting will take less money because they're really liking the thing you're creating, especially when you have a coach like Torch, too. That might help. So... I think it all depends how Fletcher works this wheel, but they're going to have to find a way to free up some money. I think they're going to have to trade TK, honestly, to free up some money. So it's going to be interesting to see if they get defense back for TK since they seem to be wanting a little bit more defensive help or if they go with just pure draft picks for Konechny from a team that actually was probably going to have a decent draft pick. Because obviously you don't want to trade into the Tampa Bay Lightning and get their draft pick because they're probably going to be 32nd. Uh, but, like, if it's a team that is actually going to have a good draft pick, it's going to be interesting, but they're going to have to move somebody. I also wouldn't be shocked if we see a blockbuster trade in Provy's move just because I've said it since Tortorello came in. I just don't see it with those two players getting along. <laughs> like... Or not players, those two, but the player and the coach getting along yeah. because we both know Avon Provorov's biggest character flaw is not taking ownership. John Tortorella's biggest hatred of something a player does is not taking ownership. So you see the issue? <laughs> like <laughs> I said, I think that that might clash and uh, that's going to be something. I'm not too concerned about it because I still think Provy's value is high enough. You're going to get a good enough trade. And I really like the emergence of Sanheim. I think he might be like Pelic on the Islanders and have just emerged in his mid-20s and just be getting better and better from there. So that doesn't really overly concern me because we have Zamor, we have York from the left side, and you got other cats developing in the minors as well that look pretty damn good down there. The Flyers' defense is very raw, but I, it doesn't concern me as much as other people because I really have confidence in our young talent. It's just a lot of those guys are raw, and they need time, but we see how much um, other teams' guys, like the Wild over the years, the Avalanche's guys, when they went through the hard times and then build up, we see how that sometimes benefits your players too, sometimes having the struggle periods to then build it up. It's not always, it doesn't always have to be gumdrops and lollipops for these players, you can let them go through the struggles in the NHL also. So I think it's going to be interesting for the Flyers balancing that out. And that's not just defensive-wise. That's offensive-wise, too, with who much of the how much of the youngsters make the team on the offset. And I think they're going to have an interesting job balancing it out. But th- they seem to be developing better. They seem to be getting good mid-round picks. I mean, look at Noah Cage. We might have a very good two-way um, forward from a fifth-round pick. So if that becomes the case, then that's a steal. And then his brother Jackson, who did get a qualifying offer, because when he's been healthy, I thought he's played fine when he's been 4C personally. He was undrafted. So if both of, if one becomes a 4C and one becomes a very good just defensive third liner, well, you got two pretty good players uh, there for pretty much a chance pick in the fifth round. And so I think the Flyers don't get enough credit for drafting. And I know Bill Metzler, the great Bill Meltzer, highlights this a lot. Because if you look at the way they were ranked, they were ranked pretty high. And I fully agree with him, Jason, and everybody else that says this. It's their development that's failed them. It hasn't been their drafting. Their drafting, if you look at draft experts with how they thought of their picks at the time of the picks, a lot of the times they were liked. It's just over time, like with <clears throat> Morgan Frost, the Flyers figured out how to mess, and Sanheim, to be quite honest, 
they figured out how to just screw up their development rather than help it, where eventually Sandheim, I just think, pulled a Zach Eflin and basically just did his own thing, and then that ended up working great. So, like, I, I think it, you have to know the approach for each player, and now with Danny B in-house, with Tortorella in-house, the Flyers, I think, are going to start working in that direction. I saw that with Ian LaPerriere once he learned the ropes of coaching in the second half. You saw him kind of do things like that, and from talking to Sam, too, it seemed like that was the case. So it seems like they're moving in the right direction. Now we just have to see it, and that's the biggest question. And if they just run it back with this team, I have a lot of question marks. I think they have to shake up the locker room, and that's why I'm not opposed, even though I am a guy that really likes Travis connecting and always liked Provorov until the last couple of years. I think Provorov's kind of fallen off the last couple of years, and it's fallen a little bit out of favor with me because of the way he's acted in certain situations. Where TK, I just think his value is good that it might make sense to shake up the locker room and then you can bring in a cop and a, one of the Stroms and then it kind of just brings in new faces and new voices because I think that's kind of what the Flyers is one of my closing points. That's kind of the main thing they need. They kind of need new faces and new voices. And just getting a guy... Like, Tony D isn't going to do that. You need to have more. And I also feel like they might get another goalie just because uh, Ivan Fedotov, obviously, we're not going to get into that whole thing. Otherwise, we'll be here until next month. Uh, But Ivan Fedotov is obviously not coming over, it seems. so. And Ustamenko was not uh, offered a qualifying offer. I could see him maybe staying with Redding, but... Uh, it seems like there might be in a market to get at least a veteran goaltender like how they used to have a guy like Dustin Tokarski, like somebody that would fit into that realm of goaltender or like somebody like that. Like, I don't see them dishing out a lot of money to get a backup goaltender at this point or that guy that the Coyotes brought back over that was the Finnish guy that played in the Olympics, Harry Sattery, who's like 33. I could see them giving like a... I see them getting like a third string guy that can compete with Sandstrom with the idea of they want Felix Sandstrom to be the backup, basically. And then if he's not ready yet, then whoever that guy is that we sign as a third string, say it's uh, just because I'm looking at him and he didn't get a qualifying offer and he used to be a decently tatted prospect. Say you sign Tyler Parsons and Tyler Parsons somehow at the age of 24 emerges in training camp and does great. Well, then he might make the team. But, like, I feel like they're more in the realm of taking a chance on some young guy like that or just going with, like, the older guys that you just get for cheap, like the Michael Housers of the world, or Christopher Gibson's Charlie Wingram would actually be a good signing because he played really well last year when he was up with the Blues. So that one I would be all for. If I had to pick from guys that haven't had the most NHL experience, but I think the fly should get Charlie Wingram would probably be the top of the barrel because if Felix Sandstrom – say wasn't ready yet, I would actually have a lot of confidence in Lindgren playing like 20 games where no offense to Louis Domingue. I do really like Louis Domingue and what he was able to do in his AHL career. I don't necessarily love what he did for Pittsburgh to get them farther in the postseason, but that's, that's okay. Um, he's more of just a pure third stringer. So I think if I had to pick anybody, they should go with Charlie Lindgren. But I, if I were them, I would sign another goaltender just to be safe at this point. Cause you don't know with Ersan, he's healthy. He's coming back from it was a fluke injury, but he's coming back from a bad fluke injury. So we have to pray and hope everything's good with him coming back from that too. No, absolutely. A lot, of, a lot of decisions to be made here. Obviously, in these next coming days, we'll see if any trades happen before Wednesday. But for those who don't know, the official free agency mark to be able to sign for free agents starts on Wednesday, July thirteenth at noon Eastern time. I think that wraps up a great show here on the grittiest takes talking all fires off season here, the draft recap, free agency preview. Well, I will say jo- one jo- thing. We do have a good goalie because we saw him. I forgot to bring this up. Uh, Yanif Perez, who Lance and I saw when we covered the NCAA, uh, the Flyers invited him to camp, the Quinnipiac goaltender, which obviously Quinnipiac isn't the most known program, but their coach uh, really got them into notoriety as they got into the tournament. They they uh, they also invited another goaltender. I'm blanking on his name right now, but Peretz is the guy I just recognized right away, so that's why the name stuck with me. 
So the Flyers didn't draft goaltending this year, but they invited guys that definitely could have went in the seventh round. So, and I think it, they still are prioritizing finding one goaltender per year. And I think Peretz might be a guy that you has a decent chance if you give him a chance. Maybe you try to roll with him as an AHL backup or something or your AHL third stringer and see what he can do or give him time with the Reading Royals to develop. It would be cool to see him in organization because I definitely liked what I saw in the NCAA. Yeah, hopefully that gets gets situated and we'll see. Again, Flyers, they have some depth there. I feel like there, there's a couple options there. And obviously your starter right now is, is fairly young as well. So a lot of options there at that goaltender spot. Yeah, and Fedotov will be over from everything I read. It's just he has to go through all the hubba bubba with uh, somebody that will not be named uh, government. So I just put it in. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> oh. um, but, I mean, unless you got anything else, I think that's going to wrap it up here. You can let everybody know where they can find you and other shows you do. Uh, yeah, uh, right now I do the JB and Steel show with Steel Flyers. Um, that we usually cover basketball, baseball, football, and hockey. Uh, and then I do also the old genre music fest. Um, that's the new one we started uh, with me, Pierlo, and Steel. That one's been fun as well. Pretty soon we'll be putting some covers and other joins on there. Uh, so stay tuned for that as well. Well, wow, that was really silly of me to say joins like that. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned for that as well. Um, but yeah, it's all been fun and you can follow me at JJ 26 on Twitter. We really appreciate you guys listening to the latest edition of the grittiest take. Please continue to subscribe. I'll turn it over to Andrew for anything he wants to share. Hey, you can find me on Twitter at AJ underscore Santangelo. Like Joe mentioned, thanks for everyone for listening to another episode here on grittiest takes. Check back with us here later on once the fleet free agency begins, probably around sometime next week, to recap any big major signings the Flyers might do or trades. But again, thanks for listening to another episode of Grittiest Takes.